Hello gang, welcome to Sketching with Izzy. Just want to do a quick sound and video check. Let me know if you all hear me and can see me on the webcam. As you may have noticed, there's been some upgrades as of late on the stream here. I've spent some time doing some homework and figuring out these different uh, applications. So hopefully that's working out. Double check my mic here. Well, I've got, uh, I, I was digging through my old uh, sketches. I do a little bit of an, uh, uh, like an audit of old artwork to see what's taking up space. And I found an old sketch that I started quite a while ago. Um, it was not too long after Carrie Fisher passed. So it was kind of like my little uh, ode, but I've always felt weird about doing that sort of thing. So I put that stuff off. I'd start the sketch and then just kind of plan it and let it wait. So let's go ahead and uh, let's load that up. Scoosh. So this is the fun thing. I uh, discovered that, oops. I discovered that I had actually worked on it a little bit. So that's a fun surprise. So I wanted to show you what the original sketch, what the sketch looked like, how I'd saved it, and then my surprise that I'd actually done quite a bit of work on this. So I think we're going to just try and finish it up tonight together. So check this out. <laughs> you can see I built up some light, did a bit of rendering on the face, and I think at some point I kind of lost uh, Wicket, but uh, I started to bring him back. But the softening and just refining. You can see uh, a lot of work was going there into the fur, getting that likeness. So I've got a little bit of reference of Wicked up. This is the final image that I've got, but I don't like how his head's tilted forward. I don't know what I was thinking with that, so I'm going to try and fix that now, and uh, we'll just uh, we'll get to painting together. gonna be some easy fixes because it looks like uh, I had a lot of things separated on different layers to start with. And I like the idea of having a little bit of overlap on his little fluffy ears here. I have just a bit, oops, just a bit of reference. Let's do a copy paste. Copy merged rather. He doesn't have much of a neck, but there is some neck in the model. Stretching that out just a little bit will help out. really key when you're doing costuming to make sure you get the scale correctly and one of the easy ways to do that is by paying attention to the folds of the materials um, depending on the shape and the folds of the materials for the cloth or leather in this case uh, it can tell you at, at, at a glance um, how big this thing is so we're we're using um, every asset available to us in order to imply the scale of Wicket here. 
Oh, I should have listed a fan art as one of the things tonight. <laughs> oh well. I forget this stuff all the time. Looks like I spent a lot of time on the face, so I think the focus today will be getting the, the log and the grass and the helmet up to the same level as the face, and uh, then coming back to finish up on the face, and I think we can do that in a couple of hours that we've got together tonight. That's going to be the challenge. <laughs> it's definitely a difference, it looks like to me. Maybe it's just the color in those two different costumes, but I think um, I like the one with, with a bit more wrinkles on the top of the head and his little cowl. I'm gonna try and use a little bit of the costume and the, the rhythm of the wrinkles to help um, sell the facial expression because the Ewoks didn't really have a whole lot of expression in the face. It was pretty simplistic. So I'm gonna take any advantage I can here and I'll try and kind of imply greater brows I think I might even do like a post pass to try and get this kind of, uh, you know, 80s, 70s Polaroid film feel. But that's something that we can save to the end. It's, it's, a, it's almost like an Instagram filter. We just play around with a, a color overlay and mess with the levels a little bit and that'll pull it off. bit of cast shadow action. It's amazing what a little bit of uh, uh, emphasis with value on an edge can do. I like how expressive the eyes are, but I'm probably going to dull them just a little bit to match the costume just a tad. 
but we'll see when when I get get back there. Like I said, we have a different focus today. Huh. Looks like the thread is on the right. This little bit of thread here is on his right shoulder, so we're not going to really see any of that. Although it would be a great detail to add in this broad expanse of space. I'll have to figure something else out for this area. Lots of evergreens. Checking to make sure the stream's still going. I worry about the video card so much still. But it hasn't really misbehaved, knock on wood. I'm going to use uh, a little bit of cross contour hatching in order to wrap around the form and imply uh, changes in Z depth. out um, out of focus textures back here Trying to avoid using the uh, the smudge brush too much, but what can I say? It just makes my job so much easier.
Ah, uh, hello, you, you vu? <laughs> Boo woo? Artie, that's right. We just went by Artie last time. Welcome back. How you doing this evening? Hopefully better than Wicket. Wicket's having a bad night. I think maybe some little uh, bright pops back there might help um, just create some visual depths. Maybe something with a bit of a little bit more saturation in it. Hi, Big Mish. Love your work. Following it since conceptart.org days. Damn! That's awesome. Old school cred right there. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining. I really miss CA.org, man. Those were some crazy times. I just missed the train off of that one. How long ago was that? Now that I'm thinking about it, that was what, like 2005? Something like 15 years ago? Hot damn! Time she fly. No joke. It really was an incredible place. I loved, loved hanging out there. I loved posting. My favorite was uh, Creature of the Week and Character of the Week competitions. Oh man, I lived for that. I would dump so much time into those. The chow, that's right. <laughs> oh man, old school, that's so great. I like, I think, um, we're going to look at Wicked in some of these other images. Because he's outdoors and it's a nice, uh, you know, the foliage of the trees is blocking a lot of that light. It gives it this nice kind of uh, sky fill. And I think we're going to lean heavy on the sky fill. Looking at kind of uh, Leia's helmet here and a bit of the sky fill on, on, uh, on Wicked's uh, cowl. So I'm going to... I'm going to start implying that now and see if it helps round the form enough so we can get some more separation between wicket and the and uh, the mid ground and background because I really gotta I gotta pump that I've, I've over rendered one part far too much which is generally unlike me that's why I was kind of shocked to find it in this condition but what a what a treasure i did i completely forgot that i had started this painting and uh, i found it in my for fun folder which is just like when i get a wild hair and i want to do something kooky i start painting random stuff and i have a for a for fun folder for every uh, month or so and there's just random sketches there's so much so much unfinished stuff stories sketches And some of these things, like like Wicket here, um, I purposefully chose not to finish them at the time. I think that might be too purpley, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit more uh, a little bit more popping of the um, of the blue itself. I think in the next level of light. <laughs> Ewoks for the win. Hell yeah. Ewoks don't get enough credit, goddammit. I grew up on these things. 
<laughs> the challenge of telling yourself not to finish. Interesting. So you compulsively just finish stuff as is. Yeah, I liked I liked uh, Return of the Jedi, and I loved the Ewoks movies. I don't get the hate. I, I completely disagree. I like these little bastard teddy bears. They're the greatest. And I will hear no different. La 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 la. <laughs> I was very disappointed when they changed the song. I guess the song was really annoying for a lot of people at the end of Return of the Jedi, but I thought it was the best thing ever. I remember I had, when I was a little kid, I had one of those little uh, sort of denim covered rainbow interior um, record players that they, that they used to sell it was like a little suitcase it was like this big and it would play the uh oh god what were they called 35s the really tiny records with the big hole in the center and i had uh several star wars um like mini stories uh sort of books on tape kind of thing but they were all acted out with the cast and everything and uh man i would listen to those again and again and again and again I think they were they were got we got them at a swap meet or something in LA. The record player too. I love that thing. All right, let's pop up that blue now and see. We're just gonna we're just testing it uh, to see how the light will feel if like if it'll get more naturalistic. Uh, I think it will. But we need to we need to really punch it to the distance to to kind of be sure that this um, that this effect is going to work. Save this real quick. I think something like that. Yeah, looking at the uh, at the navigator, which is what I always check, just to double check, make sure everything's everything reads well. I, I make sure that I look at it at about magic card size on my screen. Uh, thanks for the follow, Big Mish. Appreciate it. Um, I look at it in small size so that I don't have to squint as much, although I still compulsively do it. But I find it really helps with managing these big, big decisions I'm trying to figure out here. Like, for instance, the separation between Wicked and the background, the, the distant background behind the log isn't sufficient for me. And I think part of that is that our composition is squishing into Wicked a little too tight. So one of the things that might happen at this point is I think I'm going to do a copy, pay, a copy merge paste of the entire canvas, shrink it down and see if we can give them a little bit of breathing room. And then also push back that that secondary uh, background back there and uh, maybe it'll give it'll help with that feeling see when we compositionally when we're talking about a, a a crop that's this tight generally the feeling that you're going to get as a viewer is something along the lines of like cramped or imprisoned or discomfort things like that what I think will work better for this, because there's a specific message here, um, is to instead pull out a little bit and surround him with bigger fields of, of color and emptiness. And the goal here would be that this new composition would sell the idea of being lonely. So we'll try it, we'll see if it works. It's so hard to see past my mic. Gigantic. Copy all merged. Save again, just in case. We're gonna transform him. And I think maybe drop him down just a little bit. 
because I want that I want that green to kind of surround him. I'm gonna bring the the, the tree down a little bit and have this gr this big expansive green. Oh, that's how that's how this this uh, stream is. It's all knowledge dropping and hanging out and just talking talking shop. It's all about gang. I'm erasing out instead of painting in, and this is an easier way to kind of match and break apart the, uh, the what's the word I'm looking for? The twinning that happens when you use a uh, canvas like this. You're gonna see absolutely little strokes that kind of match, but if you break it up with uh, you know some thoughtful erasing, it, you can get away with, with murder. And combine these these bits of, of tree into each other and I'm just gonna make a whole new layer now I'm gonna select out oops I don't want the uh, kind of one of the things that I didn't like about the branch is that not the branch the fallen tree is that it was kind of exiting the canvas uh, in equal parts at, at an equal height. And this is a problem that I always have to worry about when I'm working on my, uh, on my compositions is I have this massive tendency to repeat rhythms and, ma and, and look for, I, I make a lot of, um, a lot of symmetry and, and rhythmic structures. And it, it, that doesn't look natural. And usually it can make your image look boring. So, Know your weaknesses, get in there and, and sort them out. I'm gonna use a different brush, whoops. I want something that's gonna pop up some color. So I'm gonna throw in one of my, um, one of my color variation brushes. We're gonna blur all of this back and, and knock it back with, with a more thoughtful brush strokes. But for now, it's just fill and we're creating visual noise with the color. I think, uh, let's take a look at some more. Wicket. We need to get a little bit more vivid Viridian green style color. Right now mine is gone, I'm punching it. I've been painting a lot of like leafy green trees lately, like my uh, my last Patreon lesson, which I just put in the can today. I'm editing on a new software, so it was, a, it was kind of a nightmare getting it to render. But I did a fantasy uh, illustration taking, taking the photo taking two photos basically, one that has really fanciful lighting and color, and then applying that lighting and that and those effects to the this more traditional looking composition that was really, the composition itself was fantastical, this cool waterfall and everything like that. So I'm, I'm working in uh, environments a little bit right now for the students. So I've got that, I got those colors, I got those shapes on my mind. <laughs> So let's uh, do a whole new layer. Let's set it to color. So Viridian, or more Viridian greens are gonna be more magenta blue. pop in some deep, deep greens. Let's do a soft light. Mm, still too yellowy for me. Let's do an overlay. Hmm, hmm, that fe that's feeling actually quite, uh, quite a bit more evergreen to me. I'm just gonna color pick from this now and start painting on top. The other thing that helps is when you combine the right colors with the right stroke shapes. It's very Bob Ross, but it totally works. Um, the man knew what he was doing, I tell you. Let's 
take a look. It's a good idea, I think, when you're trying to do this effect where you're doing a photo blur, but all painted strokes rather than actually just, you know, painting out the entire thing in tight detail and then doing a Gaussian blur, which is a totally legitimate way to handle this. I'm, I'm practicing working on actually painting out blur. It's one of those things I've always wanted to master, so I've been practicing a lot lately. Um, but I find it's useful to look at photos of bokeh out or, or uh, um, focal depth blur where, you know, the focus is on a figure in the foreground and you can see how the shapes, how the edges become really soft and suggestive. Everything still reads as what it is, but at this, at that, with the total lack of edges that really um, grab your eye, that, that take you away from that foreground thing. And it, and it shows you so much that edge control and values within those edge within that edge control are the things that really make a focal point pop. So I'm, I'm thinking about that as I go. How can I do simple loose brush strokes in the background that imply the the foliage that I'm after without over rendering it? And that's that is the challenge, my friend. You know who's really good at this too? I've, I've looked at a lot of, of his paintings is Simon Stallenhog. Oh my God, he's, he's got some great uh, images where he's um, doing, just using really careful brush control, does amazing photo effects. It's always so cool to see when it's pulled off. <laughs> Bob was the man. That fool raised me. He didn't even know it. <laughs> I grew up watching so much Bob Ross. PBS, man. OPB. Good stuff. All right. Let's, um, let's get some blue in. Again, I'm trying to keep... I'm still trying to push into that Viridian. Notice here. So I'm kind of looking at... So we have kind of a nice orangey field here. And then this greeny blue is what's lighting the tops of the ferns but we can only tell that it's ferns based on the rhythm of the strokes and kind of the arrangement of that rhythm there's not really any other detail in it so let's see if we can pull it off i mean this is this is the challenge right here Can be tough because you want these strokes to read but you all, again you if you let them overtake if you if you let it become about rendering in the back all is lost nothing can compete with your foreground with your focal points your focal point has to be the absolute boss let's get some of those orangies back there to maybe kind of contest of an orangey yellow. All right. At this point, my brush is working against me because it's creating so much visual noise with all of those colors that it's like little tiny edges and I want to back up off of that a little bit. So let's find something a little less obtuse maybe. Looking back at, if you think about it, what we're trying to do is like, if you were to just take a little square of this and just render that, it's just this pebbly texture. It's not foliage at all yeah uh, that's exactly that's exactly how I traditionally handle it Mish uh, it was seeing uh, how different artists especially some old-school artists when photography was just coming onto the scene handled this kind of photo effect and uh, it's brilliant it's so cool 
So I, I, I just want to keep practicing until I can get that, until it's second nature. And it's, it's this little, it's this doppling effect. It's one of those things, it's like, uh, it's so, it, it's really damn hard to, to pull it off and without overdoing it. It's just so easy to get too much, too many strokes, too much visual noise going on and it, it's all lost. So I'm not even sure I'll make it. We're doing the challenge together. But some hours spent on it is always good. You know, I think maybe throwing in some dark verticals or something might help. Let's see if that does something. Let's make a new layer just in case we don't like it. Always a good idea. And I think I'm going to knock back some of this yellow. Because again, the the yellow is it's this deciduous thing, deciduous thing I've been doing lately with the students, and it's kind of taking over. So I want that kind of cool evergreen sky to break through. Maybe that'll be the thing. And even where the light comes through the foliage like this, you gotta be careful about those edges because it's all about losing the, the detail, right? Just a hint of it. Let's look back at our reference just to make sure. So that's pretty sharp, actually. Those lights are quite sharp. Let's cheat. Let's take an actual, oh, it's a bit warm of a gray. Look at that. Okay, let's try. Notice that I'm not ta I'm not trying to take the, this this white fill all the way to the edge. I don't want to make it sharp, right? I don't need to do that because it's going to create like a really sharp moment of contrast, which boom, your eye goes into like a laser. So instead, I want to build up to that edge slowly, which gives that gives it that photo blur effect. Let's go ahead and do one that's a full all the way to the log. Yeah. Ah, I'm so tempted to just blur. Fight it, Izzy. So what I'm doing with these little blues now is I'm making the distant foliage that's peeking through. So even though it's blue, I'm actually painting trees still. They're just very far in the distance. And the the just just a touch the the contrast that I have in these darks back here, and I only want to do that to really kind of separate. Hmm. 
Hmm, there's two ways to do this. Either I can separate by lightening the background and darkening the foreground, or maybe the thing to do will be to darken the background instead. We're kind of losing the, the loneliness feel that I was after though with that. It's gonna pinch again, it'll be cramped. Let's, let's see what that looks like. Maybe that's the way to do this is to use a rim light. New layer, save, always be saving. again at, at the shadows they're very rich kind of viridian color mm. sometimes it's really hard to match color or to get the color that you want when you can't mix it that's one of those kind of lost art things though I think when you've been painting digitally so long you lose you don't you don't get as much practice trying knowing what color needs to be added to get the color that you're after. That's something that really comes with mixing paints traditionally. And the funny thing is, kind of pain in the ass about it is, different paints, like different actual mediums, you know, gouache doesn't work like, like oil. They all have different characteristics. So you gotta learn the individual color characteristics of the individual mediums. Huh. Exhausting. But man, when you get it right, when you're sitting there and you're painting a, you know, a, a portrait or something like that, and you're like, I need to get this exact color. It's gonna take a little bit of yellow, a little bit of blue, and then right here, just a touch of this black, and boom, psh, done. Yes, <laughs> the old rim light special. It's, that's a sad but true. <laughs> It wouldn't be so prevalent if it didn't work. It works damn well. I think the, the real key to these kinds of more tropey lighting effects and illustration techniques is to do them so well in the, in the effort of the narrative at hand. And if you can, if you can get that, um, it'll hide a lot of your crimes. It'll it'll get you out of out of uh, everybody's doing it prison. Okay, so real quick, let's drop in that rim light and just see how it feels. Okay, let's look at his little hat, his cowl there. It's kind of pinched up and in the center. Hmm. Good edgy brush. There we go. Bloody robo calls. Might be too much. I think it's a little heavy handed on this one. Can knock it back, make it a little more subtle. Problem is, and, and this is, this is a uh, kind of a issue that I see sometimes, especially with student work is that it's kind of like uh, baby rattlers, right? So, Baby rattlers are way more dangerous than adult rattlers. And the reason, and I'm talking about snakes here, the reason they're so dangerous is because they, do, they, every time they bite, they dump all of their venom into whatever they're biting. So there is no, there is no constraint at all. So I, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. When you're doing something like a rim light, part of what can make it look so cheesy is you're coming at it like a baby, baby rattler and just dumping everything. 
So you're, it's easy to forget that some materials are going to be less reflective than others, regardless of the sky's behavior. So the sky fill may be strong, but some materials just don't pick up that fill light as strongly as other materials do. They're just not as reflective. And, it's, and so what you want then is to find a cooler version of your base color, and that's going to be what gets you through so you don't dump all your venom. You want to be sparing. You want to use just the right amount of venom. Let's take a look again at our reference. It's definitely kind of got like... So there's, I'm certain that these are two different sets of costumes. I think these are from two different movies. One's from Return of the Jedi and one's from the Ewok movies. Maybe even uh, set shots. But the costume's definitely different. Right? Maybe I'm imagining this. I, I can't tell. <laughs> it's definitely wrinkling up in a different way. I know someone's going to tell me. They're going to lay down some, some Star Wars facts on me. I think also I'm kind of getting his head. I'm making his head a little bit squat. There's kind of more of a cherubic, like more vertical squarish shape. So let's try that real quick and see if that helps out our situation a little. Just gonna grab everything. Copy, merge, paste. <laughs> Yub nub, indeed. Thanks, Mish. Wicked smart. Right? So, yeah, Ink, this is what I was kind of, like, this was my, my, struggle when I rediscovered this image that was sitting in my old folder was like his eyes are crazy expressive but the things the costumes like their eyes are so dead and shark like <laughs> which kind of I think adds to the cuteness uh maybe I need to take it back a little because yeah I mean look at these eyes they're just huge I do I did see that some of them actually did have like sclera and uh irises separation so you can see the pupil but I think in some ways that makes them even scarier, right? It's just like this big vacant stare. Maybe that's why I like them so much, the Ewoks, because they're just living nightmares. It's got kind of this like toast shape to his head, right? Like this kind of bellying out where the cheeks are. Almost kind of an anime turnip head thing. Oh, that's right. I forgot they added eye blinks. You're right. Oh, shit. Well, I mean, he's... I painted this as a memorial piece, or I started it as one. Again, I, I couldn't, couldn't actually release it. I just had to... I just started it. But uh, yeah, so he's he's got to have emotion. That's kind of the point, right? Those proportions are way too human. Oh, I turned him into like Gurgi or something. Hmm. Damn. Ah, maybe that's the way. What do you think of that? A little better. It's definitely gonna look like him, but not really. Likenesses is just that's always been a nightmare for me, man. He's got a lot of extra fur that I'm kind of missing out on. And he's got a lot more grays than than I've got here. What I do like is that by moving the, the cowl up a little bit, it, it's created that weird pinch that I wasn't quite pulling off. So maybe, maybe we are moving in the right direction. You want to see the eyes, the eyes larger? We can definitely do that. We'll we'll uh, we'll start tackling that a little bit later. Right now, um, 
I keep focusing on the face because it's so rendered. This is the danger. If you start painting and you paint one part too much, then you just become obsessed with that part and you forget about the rest of the image. So I'm just trying to do placement, but I have to finish this trees, these trees in the background and this trunk he's sitting in front of. I wish I had that shot of him sitting with Leia. That would be the right one, I think, for this. Copy, merge, paste. I mean, why not recycle as much as I can? Excuse me. Oh no! My music died! This is a travesty. back in business. changing the shoulder direction. All right, so back to business. Come on now, we've been noodling too long. Can't have that. Let's look at the background again. I'm making little tufts of shadow and lighting essentially kind of implied blobs of foliage and what's what that's doing is it's automatically creating overlap right because there's by carving out a dark side to one thing just by virtue of doing that i'm i'm delineating the light side of something else you like that i like that. can't have one without the other I definitely think the, that not taking uh, Skywalker into gray Jedi territory was a mistake. Such a statement. Although I haven't read or really seen any of the, uh, the extra canon stuff, you know, books and things like that. The only thing outside of the movies that I ever really saw, I mean, beyond like Planet of the Who jibs and the, uh, the records that I liked as a kid for Star Wars uh, was a, a set of books that were like the, the backstory for Han Solo. So good. I can't remember the woman's name who wrote them, but they were fantastic. I liked them quite a bit. I think the thing that they tackled these books, uh, the, the old uh, solo books, that was superior, that they didn't really tackle in the, the movie, which was okay, uh, was his distrust of religion. And they really, the author really examined that in the books and made it super interesting, I thought. As a fellow non-believer, I'd say, seeing that that struggle and, and the journey of that that led to the man that we know and love, the 
dirty, dirtiest of nerf herders. That was cool. cheated. I used a texture brush, but who's going to tell on me, right? I can trust you guys. Itchy face. I'm going to go back to a simpler brush. I want a nice dark, dark uh, patch here for the ferns to kind of really stand out the shape of the ferns because they're now at a, they're my mid ground, right? You know, kind of mid ground foreground. So considering how small Wicked is in this greater environment, what we can do to help create the, uh, the illusion of the focal depth that we're after is make sure that the things that are really close to them, almost like a macro photo, have little pops of high detail because they're coming right into that narrow focal range that's necessary for fo photographing something small in this kind of detail. by adding these darks in here, it's gonna give me so many opportunities to go in there and give you a really, uh, like, sensory feeling contours to the fur and without having to do something like a rim light because that's just a lit structure in front of a dark structure, right? Instead of something where it's lit from behind separating. So just that, that will help lend quite a bit to uh, the effect of realism. Not everything can be rim lit, right? I think we need a little bit of um, implied light here. Because my Let's draw in my light source real quick so that you guys can see kind of what I'm doing in my head. Let's make a new layer, grab a brush. So I've got kind of like a sun, let's actually pick. I've got kind of a sun spot coming in kind of this direction, a little bit down, a little bit from our side of the picture plane, but not much, right? And then I have my fill light from behind coming in like this. And then I'll probably have some nice bounce lights from the greens of the trees and things like that. But that's super tertiary st stuff. I'm not gonna worry about that just yet. Right now I'm thinking about my primary light, my primary light sources, specifically the sun, so that it's gonna map out where my cast shadows are, where I'm gonna have opportunities to have little pops of brightness. Which is extra sexy when you're working with an image where playing with uh, uh, focal depth is part of the painting. Let's take a look at our trees. There's a lot of green and moss that I'm kind of missing. So let's do a little quick moss pass. I think we can just do it on this same layer. We're getting a little layer greedy here. And all it means is kind of, instead of really texturing or fully painting, we're just changing the base color of the tree a little bit so that it looks like it ha it's inhabited by uh, these moss forms. Mm. 
We also know that moss doesn't really grow on the bottom surfaces of things too much, usually the top surface. So that gives us a little bit of a hint on how we can arrange these strokes and get the best kind of moss effect out of them. Now this one, so it's tempting. I have this color over here, it's working really well. But I think where the moss would be behind his head, it might be better to go more towards this gray green that I've got going on. And it helps kind of separate that this is moss that's in shadow. Yeah, see the difference in color? Really stark. This is that, this would be like much more blue viridian color in it. And this would be a much more yellow uh, style of green. We'll get back to this one, throw it on there. Yeah, I think um, kind of implying this this shelf of structure of the mass of the tree that kind of is providing him a little bit of cover. You know, he's he's gone to he's gone to a quiet place to just you know gather himself. So he would find a place that would be a little more protective, like a little cave structure. So I'm thinking making the tree kind of almost hugging him a little bit, even though he's lonely in this greater environment, you know? And then there's little, in, in, the, in the, I know that when I first started this sketch, that part of, part of this had to have the tree next to it because he met Leia next to a, a fallen tree trunk, right? Like that's where they kind of had their first really cute uh, and deeper interaction and, and maybe spawned a friendship, right? So I think that that has to be part of that narrative. Like, you know, the beginning of a friendship and the closing of a friendship, having a nice kind of cyclical feel in your narrative can make, uh, can really deliver that gut punch that you need for something that's meant to be dramatic and, and endearing and, and heartfelt, right? You love how we talk through the thoughts? Oh, good. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for joining the Patreon. That means a ton, really. Um, I try really hard to do this, but the, the Patreon lessons are a little bit more focused. This is just like, I'm just going where I want to go. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoy it and, and welcome. We also have a Discord on the Patreon and it's quite, uh, it tends to be popping. And it's a good place to get like mid mid term, if you will, crits, because I I only do crits for uh, patrons once a month uh, for the the student plus tier, but the, I've got so many students on there that have been with me for years now, and they're they're basically like teachers aides. They're so good. They have great notes. I'm really proud of them. Again, knowing one of my biggest weaknesses is rhythm, is making too many obvious rhythms in a painting, uh, you know, with wrinkles on shirts, pants, root structures, branches. I mean, everything, it's the same size, it's got the same rhythm, it goes in the same curve. So it's something I'm, all, I'm always trying to fight and here I am, I'm doing it again. This shape is roughly the size of this shape, is the size of this shape and it's a nightmare that I keep doing this. You would think that I would have this sussed out and man, it's just it's so sad. <laughs> I will get it someday. All right. Usually my solution for this, because I know, I know this is a common problem. I'm not, I'm not uh, narcissistic enough to think that this is just something that happens to me. Uh, but one of the things I'll do is I'll pick one side and I'll just go real big and then I'll pick another side go medium and then another part and go really small and it's the cake theory I don't know if you guys have heard of that but it's a uh, it's the premise that uh, you when you have a cake you've got 
your bo big bottom slab, you've got a medium sized slab of cake, and then you've got your small slab of cake, and then you have all your candles on top, right? So big slab is big, big shapes, medium slab is medium shapes, and small, small slab, slab sounds so gross for a cake, it's like meat, right? A meat cake? Wait, now I'm rethinking that. I like the idea of meat cake. It's like a meatloaf. Anyway, I digress. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, <laughs> cake theory. So uh, that's something I have to constantly remind myself of is cake theory and making sure that I have big reed shape, medium shape, small shape, and then uh, my tertiary and quaternary details. So here's an opportunity for another big shape, and I'm gonna take it. And what I'm doing now is using these, these uh, contour following strokes to kind of imply Z depth. I think I'm gonna push it even further. I really like that hug idea I really want to kind of push that. So maybe the, the roots of this tree, or maybe this is a root, like a giant root of a home tree or something. And then it can cast shadows into our scene, eh? Oh, oh that's the way, look at that. Swoop. Don't feel bad, Wicket. This tree will hug you. Oh, that's a great happy accident right there, eh? Look at that. It's like I did that on purpose. I did not. That was a total accident. Sweet. I like that much better. Much, much, much better. I'm gonna dig in now that this is in shadow. Oh, this is such a great opportunity. Look at this. Now I can put a cast shadow over him. Oh, it's gloomy. Gloomy is sad. Ha. Ah. Oh my god. It's all coming together. One little thing. Isn't that fun? I know that I was thinking when I first did this sketch that I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to render the fur in a way that it felt like a fur suit. So we're, I'm definitely gonna try and keep with that even though this, this part's in the shade. To amp up our shade, let's see, I'm going to make a new layer. We're gonna do some digital cheating. Cause why not? We're painting on a computer, damn it. I'm gonna do screen, I think. You know what, actually no, let's do the opposite. Let's go multiply. Pick a bright color, because you always do the opposite. If you're painting on a multiply layer, you go light, and if you're painting on a screen layer, you go dark. And we're just gonna really punch the shadow side here. This looming sadness. I'm gonna punch the contrast. I know that I'm gonna want like a nice gleam on the back side of that helmet to kind of round out the composition so that my focal points are his face, his expression, and then you come into the helmet. So it's this kind of like circular feel explaining, you know, the narrative of the of the of the the shot. I'm gonna get all these cast shadows in here. I'm just scribbling them in for now. I, I since his legs aren't rendered at all, I have no reference of his little tootsies. He's got weird little tootsies, right? Like little. He's got little monkey toes or something. No, it was like, God, what was it? I'm mixing it up, mixing uh, the design up with some other Star Wars characters now. I think it was sort of like a like a bear pad kind of, right? Hmm. And 
none of my reference actually shows his feet. Little t oh no, it does. He's got a well. It's not a bear pet. He's got actual toes with toenails. That's creepy, huh? Ewokfeet.com. You know that's a thing. All right. Oh, poor Ewok. Poor Wicket. Sad little teddy bear man. Yeah, that's the way. Oh, ha, ha, ha. yeah! I love it when a light gets sorted out like that. All right, let's uh, carve out some accent values. Um, those are usually things I save for the end, but <clears throat> because so much of this shot is now going to be in a low key, uh, darker environment with, with high contrast pops, it's going to be more about making sure that I have dark accents that separate, you know, I'm going to pick out places that have uh, deeper ambient occlusion, things like that, in order to quickly indicate overlap. So we're in a new layer, and basically we'll just call this the AO layer, where we're just doing ambient occlusion now, where the shadows are pooling. Again, the only reason I'm doing this this early now is because this is this is just changed to a dark key, which means that the value relationships that we have have been shifted a bit. Definitely need some good, strong darks separating him. Because the back edge of his cowl now will be quite dark because it's in shadow too. So we, we gotta go a little bit darker to separate. Because I don't want the costume itself to be um, super important, I'm keeping that edge there really soft. It's implied. Uh, we know that the that the surface is turning away, but I'm also kind of taking advantage of our our kind of photography effect that we're after, which is that that um, punched focal depth of using like a zoom lens up close, right? I think that's the one. Zoom lens zoom lens up close for your macro shots to really get the crazy punch in uh, in uh, depth of field. The words just. Sometimes they just disappear. I am of an age now. I like also that we're gonna have these opportunities for lost and found edges because the shadow's gonna pool back here. And then we can do little pops of the cool light on the tops of the ferns and the bits of grass and it's gonna look so sweet. Doing on time, gang. Okay. I gotta keep an eye on it. I, I get a little, uh, get a little caught up in it. Let's uh, do a quick save again. Boop. Macros. Let's do a reference. Ooh, I just noticed something I didn't really thought of. Kind of imply a little swoop of cloth here. Let's throw a little coolness on it and leave it brushy and, and painterly. Doesn't need to be figured out. Again, we're we're taking advantage of focal depth. 
And it's going to hide some of our crimes. Which is good. Nobody wants to see that shit. Too bright. Much too bright. I like the coolness of that gray. Let's see. I definitely like these kind of grandpa hairs he has in his ears. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. I'm... Oop. See? I'm noodling. Ah, stop it! Okay. I'm okay. Right there, what I'm doing is I'm taking the cool light and then mixing it with the raking of the original light source, my sun, sun point light. And by combining them together and letting them kind of meld, it, it's kind of implying this combination of the, a bright fill light with my original light source. But the fill light can't. It, the light source, the original light source can slide into the form shadow penetrating into your fill light, but it can't go the other way around because the fill light is not as strong as your primary light source. If you're wondering about any of this stuff, if you haven't seen it, I have uh, my first episode of my my Izzy's Logic of Light and Color series is on YouTube free. Check it out. It's like two hours or something like that. And I just explain the initial three rules of light plus a bonus, bonus rule. And Everything that I cover in our Patreon class is built on that foundation. Everything. So the logic that you, that you learn and, and so that you begin to understand what you're seeing when you're painting and what you're seeing when you look at stuff, what's really happening there, gives you the ability to paint better, paint faster, with more authority. And it all starts with that first lesson. So check that out if you haven't seen that one yet. Look at his legs. I know he doesn't wear any pants. Little lewd bastard. Look at that. Just running around naked. Time to figure out these hands and toes, and then we move on back to the ferns and the tree. Hopefully round it out, because we've got an hour or so. We'll see if I'm if I just want to keep going. We'll just keep going. As long as you guys hang out. I would like to get this painting finished because, surprise, surprise, when I was doing my sort of uh, file audit going through and, and checking out all these old paintings, I actually found a bunch of these. So I have a whole bunch of unfinished paintings pretty much, you know, on par in terms of like goal and narrative as this, uh, but just sitting there gathering dust. So. I figured the Twitch would be the Twitch stream would be a great place to um, get back in touch with those paintings. I believe he's got three toes. Maybe it's four. Doesn't really matter that much. I mean, our wicket is not really wicket. <laughs> <laughs> there are only three people. It's Sunday. I mean, you know, everybody's hanging out. They're watching YouTubes. They're watching the Netflix, hanging out with fam and friends. It's, you know, we're weirdos. We painters. We're slavering to just paint all day. <laughs> I 
You just realized I streamed on Twitch the last YouTube vid. Oh, you saw it. Yeah, yeah, basically. These, I'd, I'd say what I do on Twitch is a little bit more generalized and it's a little less, uh, it's definitely not, there isn't a, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no structure here. Um, it's, it's kind of as Mish said, um, I just kind of talk as I go. Um, there's nuggets here and there and there's a lot of nonsense, you know, grain of salt for sure. But um, yeah. That was kind of my idea, was just kind of hang out and talk paint, talk story, and get work done. Sunday's a great day to stream. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, so actually today is the first official day of my actual Twitch stream schedule. Like prior to this, it was just kind of one day a week and uh, I decided to take it a little bit more seriously and hang out more often. So you can see the schedule on the main page and you also see it on the, the, like, the loading page for the show. But I'll be, I'll be streaming on uh, Sundays at 5 p.m., 1700 hours, Tuesdays 5 p.m. 1700 hours, and then Thursdays at 12. So Thursdays, uh, since you just joined the Patreon, that's a good thing to note, is I do the crits for patrons once a month where we actually cover it here on, on the, the Twitch stream, if you want. And uh, that's done once a month, and it's, it's done at the 12 o'clock showing because that I have a lot of uh, students and, and patrons in the UK and the time is the time zones are so damn different so i got to do that one much earlier so just a heads up and i mean uh all of my i i'm for the moment as i'm just getting this thing started i'm backing up and archiving all of the twitch streams on youtube at youtube.com forward slash izzy madrano and that is that will end eventually but for now it's just it's just going to be, you know, where I'm archiving everything. Eventually, my goal is to have that be another thing that patrons get and, and to help support them. But, uh, and then I'll have the Twitch stream, you know, it'll be live, but I know that they decay after some point. How long does it take? I'm so new to this. I don't even know all the details of it, but like, it's, what does it last, like a week or two weeks before a video dies out? I don't know. I got I to gotta watch more Twitch streams. <laughs> My lack of knowledge here is kind of befuddling. Definitely don't want him stretching his toes out too much. This isn't like a fetish shot, but it's got a, I want to show a little bit of, a little bit more action. Maybe just one is kind of cramping a little bit. Google says 60 days. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, cool. Actually, then that's kind of perfect because, uh, then I can devote, I, I wanna do content that's specific to YouTube as well. Um, kind of what I'm thinking, actually, I'll pitch it to you guys, see what you think. I'm kind of thinking about doing like little vignettes on YouTube, like uh, Izzy's Bits, like just little short uh, tutorials or little tips and things like that to deal with color and light, you know, sort of a condensed small version of what I do on Patreon, which is a really in-depth exploration of big, big concepts. I think it might be a good, a good venue for that sort of thing.
definitely appears to me that his fur changes a little bit. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, because in this shot, his fur is pretty uniform, because it's very clearly like fur cloth. But some of these, I think the later costumes, they, it, they dyed it or something, or maybe they dirtied him up a little bit. It's funny, his fur is curly in this one. It's like they left, they left his costume in a warehouse for a couple of months or something. I do need to kind of imply a, another shoulder over here. But because this is shadow, I really, I don't need to do much. When you're painting, shortcuts are huge. And one of the easiest shortcuts that I think I could ever convey is that you don't need to do something twice. If you can avoid it, avoid it. Paint one good hand and put the other one in somebody's pocket. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the character's pocket. It could be somebody else's pocket. You don't know. You don't know the relationships happening here. Don't judge me. A little toe action right there. I think I'm going to give him flat feet. I can relate, buddy. One of the reasons that feet can be so tough to paint and to draw is the overlap of planes. It's the, There's so much subtle structure happening there in hands as well but for some reason I think feet are even harder because you have the ball of the heel and then sort of the palm of the foot you know in the, in the sole part then you have the, the ball and all of those things depending on the arrangement towards the camera and you know also how the the character is posing can completely change what overlaps what feet are just a bitch to draw Especially out of your head like this. This is this was not a smart move. I'm gonna try and count probably on. A, I'll try and hide it a little bit behind some some foliage or something like that. We're gonna we're gonna sneak our way out of this. We've painted ourselves into a corner before. We'll make it. I do kind of like the idea that there's almost kind of a finger-like quality to the end of the toes, like maybe that's how they climb so well or something. Be cool to give them a little thumb, little thumb toes. I wonder, is that something I can get away with? I think little stubby thumb toes would make sense. <laughs> be kind of funny the hips out. Let's paint it in. Nobody needs to know our secret. It's just a funny thing to add. It'll be a good contrast with the attempt to really imply a f the fakiness of the fur. To go and go ahead and try and throw a little bit of somewhat realistic anatomy into it. If this is your first time joining me, by the way, I gotta give you a bit of a warning. I really don't paint that much fan art. Uh, it's extremely rare. I think this is uh, one of maybe six paintings I've done in my entire life that were fan art, outright fan art. Uh, so 
hopefully you will not be disappointed. <laughs> in fact, actually, a big part of what I'm going to be trying to do here on the Twitch with you guys is to do um, original IPs and develop them live with you. So it'll be painting, talking painting lessons, and, and, uh, and philosophy, and then also um, showing you you know, as I learned, the process of developing a new IP, getting a, getting a book made, things like that. And that means a lot of new, new stuff rather than uh, fan art. So just a heads up. Huh, there's almost kind of a plastic equality to that, huh? It's a very matte helmet. It's funny, you can really see when you look, even at these, w with these really low resolution images, you can see here the scuffing up and the paint marks that they used in order to kind of imply the, the wear and tear, the lived inness. We're gonna amp that up. We're gonna, we're gonna try and push it further. Lots of scuffing, cool scratches. I'm doing all of this and I still have no hands. <laughs> Izzy, what are you doing, buddy? I want to kind of do some quick implication here of like grass that's been laid down by his weight. But I don't want to render. This is this is not important detailing. So just Im indication should be sufficient. Nice lost and found. Okay, let's get onto this hand because that's an embarrassment right now. Let's look at his hands again. He's got these weird little grapey fingertips, gray nails. Let's see. I want to, I want to imply a little bit of like meatiness and fat, you know, the fat pads of these little hands all while also being sure that I'm making making sure to follow the the scale that's implied in the anatomy. So they kind of have to be extra stubby. Because if we look, so the actor, Warwick here, his hands his hands are small, but they're they're not small relative to his body. He has really large hands relative to his body and they fill these gloves so how they it looks like how they managed to counter that is with the big these big sort of knobs at the end of the gloves and then it, it looks like the fur was taken all the way to the end so it's just like the the last knuckle that we're going to try and capture here but i really like the idea of showing that so it, we're going to we're going to do some back and forth here and see if it works I like this kind of lumping where the, the hand is coming under and the thumb is coming over and you see that little bit of meat there. I want to kind of imply that with this tiny hand. Again, we're gonna dig in with some um, really strong ambient occlusion because he's in shadow. So shadow within a shadow can be pretty heavily pooled. Let's go ahead and bring back some fur. Throw a new layer on.
Nope, too red. Much, much too red. Let's desaturate it and bring it a little more into the yellows. A little darker. Yeah. So it's not it's not accurate to the model, um, but I'm going to show a little bit of a little bit of the next knuckle up in order to kind of help the anatomy of the hand read a little bit better. And hands are a big part of gesture and conveying emotion. So I don't want to lose the opportunity here to show it. All the while clumping the fur, going for fake fur. So that means lots of uh, sort of badly cut clumps and chunks. Kind of a almost a feather style layering. Like the feather on, on the neck of a goose, right? So you get these scalloping patterns and then carving the shadow side out of it a little bit. It has to be too uniform to be to be natural, you know what I mean? Checking to see my dogs in here with me. I think I may need to change the angle of this thumb a little bit more just to get it to read a little bit better. Since we're losing that meat, even we're losing a bit of that meatiness that I was after with that kind of the little thumb meats right there. Um, we'll have to make it back, I think, in how we render the fur in that spot. I like this brush because it has a, it has a, um, a color randomizer on it, which can be really good for things like fur or uh, grass, things like that. And it just gives you just slightly little different pops and hue for free every stroke. Again, I'm purposefully this time trying to uh, chunk it in in rhythmic pieces, unlike what we were doing with the tree. The tree is meant to feel natural, but this is meant to feel fake. Okay, I do want some part of his fur. The fur is feeling pretty good. Save. I want, hmm, looking again at Navigator on the right, the little, the little image, to kind of see where I can pick up more light. Because right now I have this nice halo effect right on his face. 
but it feels uh, a bit like um, like an island of light. So there's got to be other places where I can pop the light. I know that this fern over here on the right is going to get some, which I have been neglecting terribly. So let's start there. Let's start with the fern. And then let's move back forward and see what see how we feel. Oh God! Before I do it though, I'm going to do a quick quick slight desaturate layer. Save. Let's do color. I'm going to pick a gray. I need a nice fill brush and I want to knock back the greens back here just just a tad. I mean, I'm I'm painting the I'm painting in now the entirety of the greens, but we're going to lower the opacity of this just to ease up that desaturation. It doesn't need to be this much. parts of the of the the greenery in the background that are particularly in shadow uh, I think can live in in a gray tone and and not really lose anything here let's go ahead and see if we can take this gray into other areas parts where the the fill light are happening things like that If everything's super saturated, nothing is, right? I believe he's got a lot more kind of gray, blonde, kind of a dusty blonde in his beard. So we're gonna throw in some grays. Also maybe some years have passed, you know? Maybe he hasn't seen Leia in a long time. Let me give him a few whites. He's getting grizzled. It's a Grand Wizard Ewok? Is that a thing? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I think I'm going to prison over that one. Yeah, 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 I like I like that. The, the grays kind of grizzle him out a little bit. Let's throw a few more in his fur. Let's knock all of the reds back here back because this is all meant to be in shadow anyway. I want to make sure that it doesn't feel like it's necessarily colorized. So I'm using an eraser to kind of cut out a few, a few strokes that bring back the blondiness. One of the things that can make something feel so colorized is when you go over it in a colorized layer, of course, but you don't account for the stroke shifting. That's what's, when, it, when the strokes are there and you colorize across a stroke, it makes it feel fake. So an easy way around that is to go back your race out according to the stroke so that it's, it feels like it's actually painted on rather than airbrushed on top of everything, if that makes sense. Gonna definitely gray out all of the, the deep greens that are right on top of him. Because saturation also greatly contributes to your focal point. All right, see the differences? In painting, it's super easy to oversaturate things and uh, I mean, it's just one of those things, you're creating all of the colors from scratch, but nature doesn't really have a ton of color like that. It, there, it is absolutely colorful, but it's the play of color versus non-color that makes something colorful feel more colorful than it is. So we gotta keep that in mind when we're painting to make sure that things don't uh, get out of hand. We don't have, you know, an acid candy trip, a candy acid trip. 
Don't listen to me. <laughs> hey, Ermagerd. Welcome back. <laughs> yep, my layers are a nightmare. I know. <laughs> Thug likes to point that out on the regular. of light here and there is the music the spa music right now <laughs> I had to throw that in there so it's not all just like epic war music I'm gonna have some quiet moments to balance out the madness right battle time <laughs> Not for a wicket here. For a wicket, the battle's over. Okay? I think I gotta go back to that uh, colorized layer real quick. And I'm gonna grab something desaturated and I'm going to knock back this leather. I just noticed that it's a lot less uh, saturated than I have it. Having saturated, little saturated spots are nice, but you don't want it to completely break. Also, I want to make sure that the natural leather that the Ewoks make feels more natural. No, you won't get banned for that at all. I'm painting an Ewok because I love Ewoks. <laughs> I would be banned before you were. <laughs> Nobody likes Ewoks except for a couple of us here. <laughs> Luckily. <laughs> no. If we're talking about like major standing for 80s movies. My movie, Willow, 100%. Willow beats Star Wars times a million. Fight me, bro. Oh yeah. Anything and his drawings for that were insane. Did you ever see uh, Yodorowsky's Dune, the documentary about uh, the director Yodorowsky, who uh, had originally pitched Dune before? Uh, yeah, it's so good. Like it's amazing. I saw it at uh, the what's it called, the Silent Film Theater in L.A., and it was it was so great amazing that that guy basically he was a genius he put together the greatest artists of his time and they all went on to become sci-fi kings every single artist he hired for uh his his version of dune ended up defining generations worth of art it's incredible if you guys haven't seen it it's so good it's it's kind of amazing to, to imagine what could have been which is interesting, especially considering, like, so they're redoing Dune again right now, right? It's going to be a, a TV series. And it looks cool, but it looks really concept arty to me. It doesn't have that kind of out, like, completely out of left field thing that uh, Yodorowsky was doing. It's definitely a piece of film history right there. The story about him winning over Doll. Oh, yeah. He got Dolly, that's right. Dolly, Giger, 
Um, oh, God. Who was it that was going to play Harkonnen? It was the director, right? Um, I'm spacing on his name right now. He had... Uh, Oh, the spaceship designer. I can't remember his name either. Foss? Was his name Foss? So good. I don't like his movies, though. I'm not a, I'm not a huge Jodorowsky fan, but that, that would have been epic. I want to get a little hint of the light um, getting caught in this fur here. I think it's going to be a nice, uh, a nice effect. Let's look at when he picks up light with his fur. So because this is an interesting thing when we're talking about working with, with different materials, because the materials that they're using for uh, Wicket's fur are synthetic, they don't play with light the same way that organic materials might. Organic materials tend to have a lot more vivid color. There's uh, subsurface scattering because there's actual skin underneath it. Like if you look at the girl's hair, whoops, if you look at the girl's hair, you look at Leia's hair, how the light plays with real fur or hair versus fake is very interesting. Like the, the plastics in the fake fur tend to really dull those, those colors out. So my impulse with painting this would be to go in and, and hit it with really cool little um, vibrant spots where the light is kind of penetrating the fur and it looks really rich and beautiful. But the subsurface scattering for something that's more plasticky like this and a little more dull won't have that same effect. So we're going to stick with the gray. Kind of like what's going on with his fur up here where it looks like it looks fake. Let's switch brushes here. You've seen El Topo and that's it. His movies are, <laughs> they're really bloody nuts. Uh, the one that I, I saw El Topo and then I saw the one, something mountain. Was it Blood Mountain or something like that? It was very weird. Very difficult to watch. I mean, a lot of the symbolism, Holy Mountain, thank you. A lot of the symbolism in it is just kind of like blunt. It doesn't, it didn't really feel poetic to me, if that makes sense. But that's a whole other discussion. I, I am a half a film nerd. I'm only a film nerd in so much that I have so many friends that are hard out cinephiles. And uh, just by hanging out with them, I've kind of picked it up, you know, by proxy, osmosis, if you will. I do love movies though. Good TV. I like really cerebral sci-fi. Did you guys see uh, Devs? That was my last my last delicious cerebral sci-fi. That that writer can do no wrong in my book. Uh, Debs, um, Ex Machina, was that that other one he did? They, like he's done like like a triumvirate of just brilliant sci-fi movies. So damn good. Have I read the Incal? I tried. I didn't like it that much. Um, I also tried to read, what was the other one? The Was the end call the one that they made the movie out of? Uh, forgetting the name of it. With the, they're like delivering a package, I don't know. Uh, it's another Mobius book. Um, they were okay, they just didn't grab me. I think those, were, those would have been amazing if I had read them in my teens. I think they would have been like game changers for me. Oh, uh, it, it, and I love the fifth element. Right, but it's it's really funny how like the the materials that inspire the materials that that we tend to love can feel played out when you encounter them 
after the things that, that, that you've witnessed that were inspired by them. Does that make sense? And I have so many things like that where I'm like, I should love this, but it just feels derivative, even though it was the original, right? I have a lot of stuff like that. And, and uh, Inkal is one of those. I imagine there's probably a word for that in German. <laughs> All right, we have been totally noodling here. And we got a half an hour or so. So let's get back onto this fern. Let's take a look at some fern raft real quick. None of these are really in focus. Whoops. These guys are. Actually, we'll work with that. You know what we'll do is we'll do these ferns really um, calligraphically. And I think that might sell the effect. Since the underpainting is essentially there already. So let's grab, grab a nice calligraphic brush. I think, um, let's try this one to start and see how it feels. There's never its own film. Oh yeah, yeah. Is Maniac the, the series that was on Netflix? That's the one with uh, Jonah Hill, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty good. I liked it. It reminded me a lot of something else. Uh, I'm trying to remember now. It's been a long time since I thought about that. It was another very, like, yeah, post POMO sci fi nerdiness. Ah, oh, damn it. Not Blade Runner. It's kind of the same idea. This manic what is reality thing it was good i liked it um i'd probably watch it again but also i hadn't really thought of it since we just talked about it now in a while one thing i did I, actually i take that back i do think about it every now and then because they have a there's a song in the uh yeah pomo <laughs> there's a song in the soundtrack of that where they use marimbas and it reminds me of like one of my favorite songs of all time which is the, uh, the theme from um, True Romance, You're So Cool by Hans Zimmer. Just the greatest fucking thing ever. And uh, yeah, they did, it. they did a song that's clearly inspired by it and it's so good to just have something else that kind of has that same vein. Kind of touches the same nerves. Yeah, put it, y'all should put it on. Not that that guy needs any more money, but that's such a great song. I'm worried this is not feeling like a fern. And it is not. So let's, uh, let's fix that. I'm letting these be uh, more sharper brush, more sharper calligraphic brush strokes than what I have in the background because it's closer to the foreground. But I also don't want it to take away from Wicket. So I'm not detailing it too much. I want it to just be nice uh, indicated stuff rather than uh, really rendering. So if I can get it, if I can get the feel of the, of the shapes in, in singular strokes, it will do. Because I want it to fade away. It's just a support structure for the narrative that I have at hand. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't give it its due course. I mean, it's this, it's a very fine line that we have to, that, that we're, playing here of detail versus um, like indication and, and capturing rhythms 
that feel accurate to what you're trying to portray without you having to go in and actually describe everything literally in the, in the shot. Does that make sense? Sense? I should paint yogurt in the, in the hat? Or is that a character I'm not thinking of? Oh, yogurt from Spaceballs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, as I said, um, I really, really rarely do fan art. You're, you're seeing, this is like six times in my life I've really done this. I really don't paint that much fan art. I much prefer to paint original stuff. So we'll see, maybe. They've been talking for so long about a sequel to that. I, I wonder if it would still work these days. You know, it's kind of like people say, you could never make Blazing Saddles nowadays. I wonder if Spaceballs would work. this up a little bit. <laughs> Hi, Frios. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, the Mogwai. So I, that even that was, it wasn't really a fan art. It was, but it wasn't. It was an original pitch idea for a new story featuring them, which would have been sort of like a, a super prequel. My idea was that it would take place like three or four hundred years before Gizmo meets Billy and he's still in China. It's like, a, you know, rural China. And if you've ever seen Pompoko, the, uh, the Ghibli movie with the Tanuki, it's very much kind of in that vein where there's these, you know, the Mogwai are basically nature spirits and, uh, you know, they're defending a little river as uh, industrialism encroaches. Hey, thanks for lur lurking, Frias. Mean, means a ton to me. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, no, it's not the Water Baby one. It's actually one of their old, old ones. It's about these uh, these creatures that have gigantic, uh, inflatable, and morphing magical scrotums. And uh, yeah, how they try to save their their little forest village from uh, developers. So it's kind of like Goonies, but with testicles. <laughs> it's not for everyone. I'll, I'll be straight up about that. But the premise, the, the uh, you know, I guess you could say Fern Gully is kind of a similar story, right? It's just the idea that nature and and these avatars for nature are fighting back and in this in my story it was the the mogwai so you would see more than just gizmo you would see more good mogwai and maybe the uh you know that i always liked the premise so the gremlins idea comes from yeah avatar totally the same so uh the the idea for the name for gremlins comes from the um uh, I think it was World War One, World War Two, and the the idea that things that were not working, things you know, machines in particular that wouldn't behave, had gremlins. They they were like sprites that would just make things not work right. And uh, I'm sure there's like actually older story to it than that, but that's like the one that I think directly inspired the story. In fact, there's even a character that says it in the first Gremlins movie that tells the story of Gremlins. Uh, during his time in the war. Anyway, uh, I, th I thought it would be interesting because the, the Mogwai are these nature spirits, th these, you know, very ancient, like, elves, basically. And then the gremlins are the transformed versions of them that are anti-nature, or more like, you know, Saruman. They're a little, they're turned. The multicolored wizards. So yeah, anyway, long story short, uh, that's why I did that fan art, was actually to pitch a new story. 
And I've done that with a couple of 80s movies. I really wanted to do uh, a sequel to Leon, which would have been Matilda the Professional. And I, I wrote out some ideas for that too. Okay, I'm getting into uh, my rhythm sin here. So I'm just gonna grab some of these shapes that I've just made and transform them because they're not helping me as they are. Yeah, I think there was even talk about that. And then I also had an idea for the uh, um, for a sequel to Kill Bill, which I guess they're they're considering, or or somebody said that they would love to do it. I, I don't remember the exact news on that. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get rid of some of these sort of breaks. That's a rhythm I'm just using too much here, where the 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 leaf body is um, sharply changing direction. If I keep it brushy enough your eyes should stay on my focal point, my intended focal point, which is my goal here. That might not be blue enough. Let's up the saturation of the blue and darken the light. I'm going to just, um, uh, lock the transparency on the layer and just paint directly on the strokes. I'm cheating. It's what we do here. We're cheaters. Yeah, that works for me. Have I played The Witcher? There's references to Leon. Really? Uh, I did play, um, excuse me, I started the second one way back. Uh, I, I played that on my boat. And I just, I couldn't get into the mechanics of it. Um, the lore was interesting, but the mechanics just, the game itself bothered me. Um, the controls weren't great. And then the third one I started playing and I really liked, but that's right when I also started coming back to land. I was living in Puerto Vallarta at the time and I ended up playing, uh, I'm a shooter guy. <laughs> so I ended up picking up Call of Duty and started playing the hell out of that. I even, I had a, Red Dead Redemption 2, and, and, and I haven't finished that either. I'm, I'm bad. Limited time. I'm just gonna leave this as a stroke here and let it fall off. I'm gonna focus back on the tree a bit. something scribbly and narrow. It's a nice little pencil style brush. Yeah. I also watched the Witcher series, which was entertaining. It got a lot better once I figured out what the hell was going on in terms of the timeline. <laughs> nope, see what I did? I just made two shapes. I just bisected a shape. I liked, I did like The Witcher show. I wish that they had had a, a bigger budget. Like I know everybody's gun shy now after Game of Thrones, um, which is a shame because that it was so great to see um, that kind of fiction get a big, big budget so that you could really see the vision and the intent. And I can see, I can see with Witcher the potential and there was some really great acting in it too. Some not so great acting also, but really good stuff. And the potential was there. So I think they did get renewed.
at this point, I'm using a, a narrow brush just to create um, visual noise and texture. I have all the colors and the relative values for the areas that I'm after. So now it's just kind of almost a scribbling game, which is going to give it over time uh, with the scribbles, a bit of uh, photorealism. Well, hyperrealism in this case, it's definitely not photoreal. And it just goes to show that the relationship between line and, and the stroke from paint are, there is not really that much of a remove. Sometimes it feels like it, like painting and drawing really are two totally different beasts but in so many ways that is a a false uh, dichotomy it was like four hours in when you realize the timelines were out of sync really i mean it took me several episodes to figure that out i'm a little slow <laughs> Yeah, they did, they did completely blow their CG wad, but, I mean, it looked cool. They managed to do okay. I think it was decent. And it was certainly, like, a good proof of concept for The Witcher. I'm gonna knock this one back again. By using this hatching, I'm just kind of describing uh, undulations in the form. I think right here might be a really spot to throw in light from the sun like a bit of gold Traditionally, putting this kind of, of pop right next to the edge is a really bad idea. And it may end up being a bad idea for this too. But what I'm hoping to do, the experiment that I'm, that I'm um, engaging in here is to see if it will work as sort of a, a compositional arrow towards our focal point. Take a look at our rough again. I never want to get too far from it. There's always information that can be gathered. Like I, I'm looking now at this loam. I really like the loam and the fern and the, the dry sort of um, the substrate of the ferns that are decaying looks pretty cool. I think we could probably introduce some of that. Oops. A lot of that will be on the ground, but I also kind of want to hint at it up in the trees because, or in, the, in this tree in particular, because you don't want to have just kind of this barren spot. It needs to, it needs to feel populated. And the only way you can do that is, is being mindful of the rhythms of that, of the, the carpet that we're inventing here. I'm thinking of it as like a shag carpet. Isn't a bad idea. Just implying little bits of overlap and some chunkiness, ambient occlusion. 
When it comes to foliage, this is one of the most common shapes that, that I think that I've drawn and that I see. And that's to take, let's make sure I'm on a different layer. That's to take an object that's overlapping another object, right? So it's creating a little bit of a cast shadow or a form shadow on the other one and just kind of crossing them like this. So it's kind of this A shape. I do it all the time with uh, foliage. You can see my little A's down here. But you see it, I mean, you see it also in these shapes. There's lots of little triangles of overlap. See the little A's everywhere? I mean, you could argue that they're all the letters of the alphabet, which is true. But we're just simplifying, just digging in. Okay, we're rounding this out pretty quick. I'm feeling pretty good about the background now. I think uh, it's sufficient. There'll probably be like a last sort of 
accent pass that'll do to it, but I think it's good enough for now. So let's get back to Wicket, see if we can finish him off. I do want to bring back some of that ruddiness that I have in his nose into the fingers. I, I did let the digits get a little dead looking. Let's uh, switch brushes again. Maybe his to tootsies are a little more grayish and that's okay. Kind of a thick effect. Like they look a little bit like there's, you know, fungus in them or something like that. They're they're really dense uh, fingernails. So we're gonna we're gonna keep that in mind as we do ours. This helmet. Oh no, let's do the feet. They're pretty unrefined still. I don't need them to get too detailed, the toes or hand feet or whatever the hell it is I'm painting here, um, because they're, again, I'm, I'm supplying them as details that help support the narrative, but all the narrative is happening in the focal point, and that's, that's where all of the big stuff needs to happen. One quick. Yeah. It's good enough. And then in that same vein, let's kind of uh, darken the little, the sole of this, this foot to kind of match with the other one. I'm, I'm giving it a little too much light and, and it's taking away from the overall read. It might end up being more worthwhile to actually knock the entirety of the hand feet into shadow so that they don't uh, detract too much because they are weird. His <laughs> hand feet are the best. <laughs> Thanks. I like to paint hand feet. Uh, how much longer am I trying to spend on this? You know, I don't know. 
Um, I was hoping to be done about five minutes ago, but uh, that is not the case. I think, I think we're close. We're real close. It's one of those things that it's like, you know, you'll know when you see it kind of deal. Um, I, I could easily at this point just do a accent value pass and be done. But I feel like the kind of the crux of this is that helmet. So I got to get into the helmet. I got to nail his eyes. I think I will make him a little bit bigger. So um, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I think I got maybe another 20 minutes in me. I don't know if that'll be enough. Probably not. Uh, you know, at this late stage, it's all about like carefully planning. Also, I talk too much. There's that. Um, we're really close, though. I'd say we're like 97% done. It's, it's super close. It's just like kind of careful noodling at this point. And then I'll probably do something pretty drastic with those eyes to kind of bring him back more towards uh, model. I think they need to be yeah, at least like twice the size that they are right now. But I'm saving that till the end. I always save the fun bits for the end. Let's take a look at that helmet. Yeah, it's just wrapping up. I mean, that's that's usually how it goes. I, I try to save the finish up. I, I always like it to be, you know, the big struggle is just figuring out the meat of the problems. And then I try to save all of that detailing, like that last minute sexy stuff for like the last 30% of a painting. And I also like to try to get it done quickly. So it's, it has, you know, have you ever done it? Have you ever done a piece where like you've drawn something, you drew a sketch, and the sketch was dynamite, and like it was interesting, there was some motion into it that was really great, and then after you painted it, it just died, like it went really dull, all the life went out of it. Um, that's one of the ways that I, I try to tackle that dullness is I limit that the the finishing moves. I try to get them done quickly and and vibrantly so that they have that sketchy quality and it brings back what was lost because yeah it gets yeah, exactly it gets really stiff so that's that's generally how i approach this so even though it seems like you know we're coming into the last stretch i've only got a few percent left to go to finish this thing out actually that will tr i generally try to make that my fastest part of the project and that's to like just whip in these um, these you know, filled with life strokes and, and these big moments and the colors. And, and that's when I like to take big risks is right there at the end to see uh, what I can get away with. And, and if it'll, it'll keep that, that vividness, that sketchy kind of feel. Don't cry, Irma Gerd. Oh, saying of which, that's the next step. So I've, I spent the weekend making badges and I gotta make uh, emojis next. I have really no idea what to do for that. Or not emojis, I'm sorry, emotes. I gotta say, use the right word. Oh yeah, uh, definitely come on in. Like I said, three times a week, um, Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. I'll be doing my my little silly spin on the net. I may need to take this into next the next session. I don't know. May, maybe not. Um, I'd like to I'd like to get started on my my big project. The sooner the better. Um, but like I said, I have a whole bunch of these rando sketches that I started and never finished. So. We got plenty of content. Hey, Daniel. Welcome back. Yeah, still going. Just having fun. Painting some little fuzz monsters. Yeah. Uh, actually, that's a big part of, of my stream idea that I'm doing here is the accountability aspect because um, I want to start making my own projects and you know, it's so hard. Although Daniel finishes all kinds, he's the master of it.
Hey, no worries. Good to see you, man. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, that's the, my thinking is uh, like Daniel's done. Daniel's put out several books and, and original IPs. He writes stories. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm done waiting for people to, to pick up my ideas. I'm just going to make them. I figured it would be fun to make them with you guys. And then, of course, there's the accountability because now, now it's public and on the line. See the little A's? I'm just making little A's. It's very natural looking. Okay. I'm trying to jump around, dig in details here and there. Exactly. I mean, that, my hope isn't even so much. I, I've given up on getting getting projects picked up because I've done, you know, for so long I've been playing by the rules, you know, like you got to write a screenplay, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I've been doing that. And it's just, it's, it's a slog, man, doing things the right way. So I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to make shit. I'm not going to ask for permission anymore. So I'm excited to get started. Of course, it's as you well know, it's it's super tough to start to to put out new stuff because it's hard to get the following on it. But you've done such a good job, especially on Instagram, getting getting a mass following. That's gonna be that's my upcoming struggle is to just get, kind of get people to get behind what I'm trying to do. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that difficulty, that the, the sort of natural predisposition that folks can have towards avoiding new stuff. Like they, they tend to prefer, you know, the things that they know, which I understand because you, you know what you're going to get. But that's just not a place I can live. I got to make stuff. Just got to. Compulsion. I'm going to carry this fold up through to kind of imply the tension of this, of the stitches going in here. <laughs> the Izzy way. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. I'll do it the Izzy way. Patenting that. The following IG is kind of bogus. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that whole like 10% follow through thing, right? Like if you have 10,000 uh, fans, you know, 10% of them will engage online and then 10% of those that engage will actually purchase. And it's, it's tough. That's the numbers are just so hard on that. One of the things that infuriates me about concept art is that so much of it is just aping on stuff we've seen. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some of that. But I mean, the reason that that happens, it's not, it's not that the artists are, in, are incapable of making new things. It's that people buy the stuff. So it's, it's basically you're voting with your dollars, right? And the fact is, is that one thing tends to sell. And that's this familiarity. Familiarity really sells. Really? To, was, that was your experience with this last book, Daniel, that, uh, that you didn't get a bunch of backers on it? That's a shock. It's not the suits. You can't blame the suits. It's the people that are buying. The suits will, the suits will follow wherever the money goes. That's just true. My mustache is just... 
gross. Anyway, uh, the, wherever money goes, they'll go. So if you're going to push for something, I mean, look at look at all these examples lately of uh, of boycott boycotts and things like that. The the companies will bend because they want your money. They don't they don't care about anything else. So it's not that they have a visual vision that they want to, or a, an explicit visual vision that they're looking to follow. It's just that that's where the money is. So it's really actually our fault. Which sucks to hear, I know. It's just, it's so tempting to go for what you know. I gotta check her helmet again. Okay, so it's just sort of like a weird mask. We don't have a... I mean, I'm sure there's like really detailed photos for cosplayers and things like that, but I didn't look up any of that. This was just like a lark at the time. <laughs> 126k followers on IG and 390 backers? You are kidding! What? What? Man, we got to talk about that. I'm so curious about your experience. Wow. Wow. Damn. That is tough, man. I'm sorry to hear that. My experience in general has been I am I am just supremely bad at knowing what people want. So when I make new stuff, I make stuff that tickles me just fine, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't tend to sell. And this is where this is where I have to sit and be introspective and think like is this the fault of the buyer or is this the fault of me not being able to read that read that particular room, which I think is probably more the case these days is that I just have a very weird uh, aesthetic interest and narrative interest and it just doesn't match up with basically society <laughs> hell yeah weird shit I think I'm gonna pick up just a little bit of this uh, sky fill light to throw in here on some parts so that it feels like it's part of the same scene because right now there's aspects that are in shadow and should be picking up a little bit of skylight. So the colors need to be present. But again, don't let the fill light dominate if the base material doesn't actually allow for that. You just want to hint at it instead. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point in terms of the goal, how you place your goal. I think what I'm talking about with me is that I, I have a really hard time understanding. So it's not even a goal thing for me. It's that I, I would love to sell. That would be great. I just don't. I, I, have, I struggle to fathom what other people like. A lot of the things that, that are sort of cool, uh, I think are kind of passing cool rather than deeply cool. But that's just personal opinion, you know? So when I try, I've, tr I've actually tried this, you know, I'll sit down and, and I, had, I had a writing partner for quite a while and we would, we would sit and brainstorm on things that would, we would call basically like popcorn ideas with the goal of being like, we want to sell out. We want to make money with this story. And I'd come up with, you know, epic stories that I really liked, regularly turned down. I think that's okay though. I think that there's just, there's room for different stuff out there. And I think 
that's one of the things that's really drawn me to Twitch as of late is that I feel like this is a place where I can do what I want to do, tell the stories I want to tell, and um, you know maybe find an audience that'll fit what I'm after rather than the other way around. Because I haven't had much luck with that. Did a teacher tell you you needed less weird projects in your character portfolio? Or only Kojima would want to hire you? <laughs> Damn. Well, yeah. Those are different things, too. I mean, if you're looking... If you are looking to be hired to be a concept artist, a concept artist's job is very specific. You are answering aesthetic problems you are solving aesthetic problems for an IP that is usually art directed by somebody else usually creative directed by a totally different person and your responsibility then is to try to find a way to be a problem solver rather than an originator of of new stories and things like that um, which I, I enjoy doing as a concept artist, I really like that that challenge of problem solving, but it's it, they're very different beasts. Oh, you're a modeler. That's cool. I'm trying to teach myself 3D. That's a whole whoo. It's a different loaf of bread, my friend. That is tough. It is the same way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Daniel, it sounds like we're actually, uh, we're cut from the same cloth there. Like, it's just, the stuff that, that, that really flies just doesn't usually grab me. I like really challenging things, really out there. I, I guess the entertainment, I mean, we were, we were actually talking about, um, Oh god, I'm completely ba bailing on his name right now. The guy that wrote Devs and uh, um, Ex Machina. We were just talking about some sci-fi that's that like is more cerebral, that really requires you to um, ponder it. Like it's stuff that you have to process. I love that kind of stuff. And I love talking about it afterwards. That was one of the things I actually missed the most when I was living in Mexico. I would still go to the movies, but then like. And nobody to talk, you know, cinephile stuff with, like, take it all apart. At this point, I'm just inventing elements. I really don't know what this looks like. I want to pick up little pops of light. Again, this is meant to be a less saturated. This is, this is, you know... The way I'm imagining this narratively is that the leather that comes on Leia's gear is synthetic. You know, it's made in a replicator or something on, on a starship. It's not the same leather that, that, you know, the Ewoks gather from killing, you know, giant birds or whatever. You're just picking concepts that you liked. <laughs> just keep I mean I think it's a good idea when you're when you're talking about portfolio work is to have two portfolios a portfolio of stuff that you love and a portfolio of stuff that answers the questions and then you'll have you if if it's a place where they can where they have imagination and they can see what you might have to offer as as a outside the box thinker you got the book to show it if they're looking for somebody that's going to be a problem solver of very specific things and just answer these questions, you got the book for it. It's a win-win. That's basically kind of how I went. I started out with my, my original portfolio leaving school was very weird. And uh, I mean, to the point where <laughs> I, had, I had some very unusual interviews as a result where they were like, what in the hell? <laughs> I found personally that those tended to be the people most excited and and like we would have something to talk about during the interview because I painted something so ridiculous and over the top and they were just mystified by it. 
Um, but I mean, that didn't work for everyone. The way I justified it to myself was I decided that, okay, uh, they didn't like the crazy stuff I do. This was just a litmus test. They don't, I, they can't, uh, they can't handle what I'm, what I'm out, I'm all about, right? So that's, that's how, you know, that's when I was drinking wine and crying in the bathtub. That's how I got out of it, right? But to be, to be fair on the IG front, I didn't understand how IG changed. Yeah, I guess uh, it, their algorithm or logarithms or whatever, my hair is being crazy, do, they're different now, right? Like, uh, I had a friend explaining that to me this last year, and I guess I, guess I have just been poop in the bed on that. I'm not, uh, I am terrible at, at working the, the uh, algorithm for your, for social media. Ugh. So frustrating. Oh, right. I was going to do, I started, see, this is what happens. I just start blabbing. Are we on time? You know what, I'm gonna speed this part up by cheating. We're gonna make a new layer, set it to screen. Grab a bigger brush, not that one. I don't even know why I still have that brush. And I'm gonna just... Too bright, remember when you're doing screen, it's gotta be a dark color, and when you're doing multiply, it's gotta be a light color. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here for blabbing because that's about all I've got. Loads of blab. He's a talker. Here, I'm kind of mimicking uh, the anatomy that kind of goes behind an ear. Just to clarify because... Uh, when you're doing these kinds of things, not everybody knows what it is you're painting. Not everybody's going to get this reference, right? So, in the vein of clear communication, sometimes it's wise to render things in a way that communicate what they are with, with less room for wiggling, as it were. I'm going to do a big saturation pop here Again, most of your following by doing random little sketches and process I really need to mo focus more on quality really hmm Wow the finish thing never really did work for me I noticed for sure that the ones that that were picking up Big numbers and doing it quickly were ones that were artists doing uh, process stuff like you. Um, who's another one I think of? Naomi. Just churning awesome sketches. That brush stuff you've been doing is just kick ass, man. You've been doing that for a long time, though, right? Like a brush, straight to brush uh, figurative stuff with lots of cool filigree and decor. I love that stuff. Can't post too often. What? <laughs> See, this is why I suck at this. None of this makes sense to me at all. <laughs> What's the saturation pop for? Uh, visual interest. Uh, it was just a, a personal uh, decision at the time. There is no uh, specific reason for it. If you, if I wanted to get, if. See, this is the this is actually what what great uh, painting design is. It's just elaborate bullshitting. So I'm going to bullshit you right now and say, oh well, I added that pop of color because that pop of color reflects the leather onto itself. So it's pooling light, works, right? Technically works, but really why I did it is because I just wanted color there. <laughs> Not even to better imply the material. It was just a, just a fun color choice right at that time. A lot, it, I mean, once you have the, the most important thing is values. 
Once your values and your, uh, are figured out, if you're trying to paint something realistically, your colors after that can be as cakey as you want. There's some, there's some amazing examples of artists that take that to the nth degree where their, val their values are on point, like ninja level. And then they throw in these crazy colors and your eyes just go, ah. but it always works because the values are right. Don't post more than once a day. Okay, well that's good to know. Thanks for that tip. <laughs> There's so much stuff I don't know, damn. I wasn't, I did for a while post every day. I think it was after I had talked with Pete and he was talking about how he A-B tests, uh, Peter Hahn, how he A-B tests his, uh, his concepts because I was, I was complaining to him about how uh, it sucks that I can't figure out what people like. And he said that what he does is he just puts out stuff and things that get more likes, he just draws more of that, which makes tons of sense. But it's just not something I've ever been good at. I want to uh, imply some stitching here. So I'm gonna make, an in make a sharper break. Maybe even throw in some texture. Grab that for no reason orange that I had there. So on this last lesson that I just uh, put in the can today, um, the uh, a lot of what I'm doing with it is sort of more fan fantasy style, fantasy stylization and using colors to punch the fantasy aspect. So I, I was taking uh, painting a forest and taking really out there colors and throwing them in there for little accent colors to make it pop. And it was all about how to, um, how to use simultaneous contrast with color to uh, manipulate your viewer, basically giving them l literal, in a sense, eye candy, in a very non-morbid sense, hopefully. What I've done. I've done it again. Damn it! I always do this. There's three exactly the same size shapes. Ugh. Damn it, Izzy. This is such a habit. It's so sad. I'm gonna bring this one down and just connect it all here. One big stroke. See, this is what I'm talking about with the. Uh, we're trying to be more calligraphic and uh, and loose in the last stage rather than just in the in the beginning stage. Don't put much text with the post. Really? Yeah, I'm definitely more like emotion driven. Like that's the kind of visuals that I like to convey. Yeah, we're very similar in that front. Like I, I just prefer the the capturing a, an emotional moment or some kind of emotional intimacy is like, that's my favorite stuff to paint. pretty much done. I'm over rendering like crazy. Where are we at on time? Oh shit. Oh my god. So much talkie talkie.
I'm just gonna pull a lot of this shadow and let let a little bit of loss and found happen back here. Cause I, one, it's nice and mysterious, and two, I don't wanna be accountable for figuring out all of these details I just don't know. Visual interest is a reason. Ah, uh, this brim is wrong. Okay, so this is actually something that I run into pretty regular and I've seen it happen with others. So let's cover it real quick. And that is specifically with hats, but any kind of ellipsoid um, object, you can lose your ellipse really easily in the painting. So it's a good idea to try and find it after you've done your painting. God damn. It's close enough. And we can see what happened to my ellipse here. Okay. So if by following that, we can see that the brim that I've done here is broken. So I'm gonna go back to the previous layer following what I've established with my, with my draw-in. We'll see if we can bring it back. And it makes sense. We should see, because this side of the brim actually turns towards us a little bit, we should see more of it than we do the side that's, that's picking up all the light. Sometimes you just gotta stop and, and just sort it out. Oh shit. See what I did? Do you see what I did there? Mm. Oh, Adobe, when will you figure out this Damn undo thing. Ugh. Make sure I'm painting on the right layer now. Okay, Jesus. <laughs> you went to school with her? That's awesome. <laughs> How cool. So random. Oh, Los Angeles. Adobe needs an ellipse tool. They do. But before they do that ellipse tool, I want them to solve the issue of painting on a layer, hitting undo, and then sending you to the previous layer. I hate it. I hate it. Mmm. Is it the same color? Oh shit, I don't see. Oh, it is. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I definitely got this way wrong. This should be more like that and shadow. Then we can pick up the inside. Yeah, that's way better. I can tell already. I don't want to futz with this too long. It, what I really want is just to get the shape right and then move on. I don't want to render it. This can all be shadow. be too dark so let's uh, imply the we 
I gotta follow this ellipse I've already established. Just implying the edge is enough, I think. <clears throat> oh, it was in NorCal, okay. <laughs> yeah. They must have done like a casting call right nearby. Oh, it is the worst, that undo thing. All right, so we turn this off, go back to our painting, get scribbly again. <laughs> there we go, close enough. Shortcut time. Let's just capture the a sharpened edge rather than rendering everything out. Let's take a look at the brightness we have here. So that's ooh, 70%, even less. We can pop this up about there. I want this to be like a the secondary kind of read focal point because it is th this is the story so the face has to be nice and detailed and, I, and I'd like to have some really good uh, sharp speculars on this by doing these speculars. So you saw how loose and rough the metal structure was that I painted, but by sharpening the edges just with a, with a really tight specular, a lot of that just goes away. It just becomes visual noise. The specular becomes the new structural definition of the shapes. See that? Didn't even, didn't even paint on the same line. to indicate pitting on the edges of, uh, of surfaces like this. It's a cheap, really easy, you know, same thing with little scratches. You can do little scratches like this. It just reads this cool detail and it's, it requires minimal to no effort. This is another reason why I save this stuff for the end. doing a little kind of um, a directional thing. So there are little little hot spots, little pops of value, but what, what I'm really trying to do with them is create a line that takes us back up into our shape up here. It's cheesy, but it works. <laughs> Why not? This is the accent value stage in which I go in and just sharpen up edges. And I'll throw in my little speculars and cool things like that. We are like very close to done right now. And my thinking here is to be brutally uncaring with my strokes. And it's the same 
the the idea is to have that same kind of carelessness, the carefreeness that you have when you're doing your initial sketch, because it's the life is in these strokes. I don't know about you, but when, when I'm looking at a painting that's really grabbed me, the, one of the things that I really notice about them is that there's this aspect of like almost accidental perfection. And it gives it this, it'll give these paintings these, these qualities that feel like, um, like it could, like obviously it is this way, it could not have ever been any other way this is the perfect stroke, this is the perfect shape, this is the perfect color. And I mean, that's something that absolutely seems to come with experience and trust in your abilities. And so me doing this kind of like laissez-faire, uh, <laughs> incorrect word, but funny, uh, approach to these strokes at the end is kind of like a fake it till you make it approach. And I gotta say, it does seem to work sometimes. Every now and then you get lucky. And if you have, if you have all the structure figured out because you've already assembled the painting for the most part, these last bits, even if you mess them up, they can't really be wrong because you're still following the rules that you've established. You've done all the hard work already. Everything is already there that needs to be there. All right, let's sort out this eye thing and I think we're done. Oh yeah, you want to, I'm all about shortcuts, like finding ways that you're gonna get little boosts for minimal amount of effort. <laughs> Just free market strokes, I love it. <laughs> My viewers are smarter than the average bear. Put out, plop, and so on. Ooh, I wanted, to, I do remember I wanted to do this. I wanted to just a little quick implied overlap with these twigs. Might be too much, but a little bit. That works. All right, let's back to his eyes. Let's suss out these eyes because this is the last bit that's really going to hold me back. So what was the agreement? They just need to be bigger, right? Bigger, and I'm going to try and deaden them out a little bit because they're a little too animated, I guess, is the word, which is something I'm pretty consistently guilty of. <laughs> his eyes are almost the same circumference as his nose so I think I'm close now is where you get to see the real amusing aspect of being able to watch me paint is the faces I make when I'm painting faces. <laughs> I can feel it. Like I get all like super into it. I make the faces. Yeah, I think bigger was better. Let's turn them off and on. Yeah, good call.
Let's, um... Let's see. He does have pretty strong speculars, but there is a dullness. It almost looks like bowling ball laminate or something. Which gives it an alien quality, I think. Like, this one doesn't seem to have it as much. Maybe it's just the direction of the light. But these feel like little tiny bowling balls to me. So that would mean kind of a, a waxiness that I need to capture. So we might have to we might have to knock back the pupils altogether. I think. And count on the eyelids maybe to sell the emotion that we're after. <laughs> yeah, you got to act it out. It's it's weird. Like I feel like I can I can better I can better paint expressions if I can feel it on my face. Like I can I can translate that feeling to directly into line. It's it's a weird. I can't explain it. It's just it is a thing, and I do it a lot. Oh boy, fingertips are hurting. Definitely getting close to time to take a break. New layer. Let's throw away these layers that don't mean anything anymore. My perfect ellipse. Scroll back up. New layer. Wait, I already did a new layer. I did already do a new layer, you silly billy. Okay, let's dull these out. Get rid of some of that animated expression, which is very much, this is something I learned on the job on God of War, was that the, the kind of cartooniness of, of eyes that you're painting very much comes back to iris placement and how much of the sclera, the white of the eye that you can see. Those two things together can make something that's super vicious, like a you know an evil cyclops or something like that, look silly if you show too much of one or the other in the wrong way. And it's very subtle. It's one of those things like when you know it, you know it kind of deal. It's just very subtle. I think what I'm going to do is imply iris without getting too hard into the pupil like I had it. I'm not doing what I would do traditionally for like a human or, or an alien with real eyes. I would try to um, use really vibrant colors, especially for this part, like, like little glinting off of the iris uh, and the inside of the, the cup of the iris of the eye. And in this case, I'm using a dull color, and that's part of that allowing, allowing the costume to kind of come through a little bit, the, the slight fakiness. And I think part of my thinking here for this is that uh, it's like practical effects versus CGI, right? There's this... Of course, practical effects have kind of a campiness to them. You can kind of see the jitter of them and you can see the movement underneath. And I mean, they're so much better now than they used to be, but there's something endearing about that fakeness that makes it feel more real. And I don't, I mean, I'm sure there's a word for that. It's, I guess it's kind of like the reverse Uncanny Valley or something like that. But to, to me, to capture Wicket, like, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a cartoon. I, I'm pretty sure I remember a cartoon. And the cartoony Wicket didn't feel like Wicket. Wicket, it's the earnestness of the fake that makes it work for me. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to capture that. That's why I'm trying to paint the fur in less realistic, less stylized. I want it to feel like a fake fur suit because that is the earnestness of the character for me. I don't know if that makes sense. Which also means 
we gotta dull down our speculars just a tad. And I think one of the things that keeps them feeling plasticky is, the, is that the color, the local color of these see-through lenses is actually influencing the specular, which is not something that you see so much on the gloss of an eye. The eye is more reflective. This is absorbing light, bouncing around inside, and it's coming through and it's affecting the color of the, uh, the specular itself. So let's do that. Let's just let it happen and see if it helps aid our specular here. I, I hypothesize, I don't know if this will work, but I hypothesize that by doing it this way, it will make it feel a little more dull and flat. I will still um, do a sharp, uh, a sharp specular there that's the reflection of the light source because they are sharp there, but the color and the drop off of it are totally affecting the feel of it. <laughs> you will be painting for shit, I can promise you that. Wait, I don't know if that works. Hmm. Yeah, they don't really have eyelids. They're almost like these. <laughs> That's like the scariest image. <laughs> that is the shit of nightmares. Dare I get rid of the eyelids? I don't think I can. I really don't think that I would be able to convey this, the emotion that I'm after without this part of the expression. I think I'm going to leave them in. in. In fact, I'm pretty sure at some point I did try that. See, I'm curious. Let's let's turn off all the painting I've done. This is something that I do all the time. Is is I'll uh, I'll find everything I've done in the day. I think uh, where did we start? We started here. No, that's part of it too. Yep. Yep. Okay. So everything is here up. We're gonna group it. Control G. Turn on the visibility on all of that goodness. All right, turn it off and turn it on. So we can see what was lost and what was gained. It's a pretty big difference, huh? Lots of light has been added. We rounded out the forms with the skylight. That made a huge difference. And then by choosing to hug the character with the, with the, with the root system, it kind of gives it a little bit of a, a safe space feel. So he's lonely, but in a safe space maybe. Anyway, so let's turn these off. Let's take, yeah, see, I did have kind of a more like Yorkie eyes, like little dead eyes, like a Yorkie. You heard me say it, I ain't taking it back. Yeah, see here I, here I was leaning really hard on tears and I wanted to, I, did, I felt like that was too easy. It's too obvious. I needed uh, something that had a softer impact. All right, let's go ahead and dig in. I think I'm gonna leave it that kind of peachy color because again, we're, what we're doing now is using, we're developing speculars on a plasticky surface rather than eyeballs, which is was the sin I was committing earlier. Bloody hell. Ugh. I hate that shit. See how it feels a little more dull? Part of that is really softening part of the specular. That one doesn't even need to be there, to be honest. Light isn't hitting that. I'll knock that back down. Which is good because now one eye becomes the focal point.
But if you went with the tear because it's more obvious, more folks would get it and then get more likes. See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of implying that he's got wet lashes. I mean, right? Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? Christ's sake. Mm. So you're making me question my whole... Did you see this? Too much. It's too much. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll give you the. I'll give you more tears there, but I'm gonna get rid of them here. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. True. It's a good point. Yeah, I think this is about it. We're, we're pretty much there. Let me do some final values right here. Nope, oh, too much. Just a tad. Maybe a little hint of that blue. Elsewhere. Gotta finish my thoughts when I'm speaking. This is wrong, I don't like that, so I'm going to pull it, oops. Little bit of whisker overlap. The face fur is definitely more natural than it should be, um, according to the aesthetic that I was after, but I think in this case it'll fly on account of the emotion. We're kind of breaking the character. Let's get a little bit of those tufts that come up from the forehead. They need to be bright though. I think that those little tufts kind of give him a, a youthful quality. They did really cut in tight around the nose and that fur is really fakey looking. So this is kind of where, uh, yeah, I'm definitely breaking my aesthetic is that this, all these little subtle bits of fur uh, are making that part look more realistic. But again, I don't care. Uh, the emotion is what I'm after there. I think we're done, gang. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it. This one is, it's dead. Uh, time to move on to something else. My hand hurts. <laughs> so we'll start up again on something new, either from my, uh, my dustbin of uh, previous four fun images, or uh, I may have in time finished my pitch for this project that I wanna do here on, uh, on Twitch with y'all. Um, yeah, hopefully you had fun and enjoyed hanging out and chatting. I love doing this. Um, we're gonna be doing it three times a week, so please come back, join, uh, pitch in with the uh, various discussions it really helps the time fly when i'm when i'm just noodling on shit so 
Hey, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Big Mish. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, it was really fun hanging out. So we'll see you next time. Until then, paint smart, paint sexy. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because, like they did, you want to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not. You're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication, and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Light grammar is for language. Light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. Until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds. Because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson, I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode 2, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode 3, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes 5 through 8 are all about rendering materials. Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. 
The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes, like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap, valuable, and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration, just like I do for Magic the Gathering, from assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end. Each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood, and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy.